Well, good Thursday to you all, and welcome to this 18th day of January. It is day number 18 in our journey through the Bible. Hello to everyone out there. My name's Hunter. I am your brother and Bible reading coach, someone who shows up every day to spend a little time together with you in the pages of the Bible. A warm welcome to all of you, especially to our new listeners to the podcast. If you're new here today and you are looking for a one-year Bible reading plan, well, you've come to the right place. But we have planned for more than just that. Our desire is to allow the pages of Scripture to point the way to the one who is the living word, that we might be transformed by him. As we look at him, as we begin to follow in his ways, that, my friend, is what this podcast is about. So if that's what you are about or what you desire, man, I am so glad that you have found us. And today we are going to be found in the book of Genesis. That's where we'll start chapters 44 through 46. And we'll finish our reading in Luke chapter 18. Did I tell you that I'm glad you're here? This is the word of the Lord. Genesis 44. When his brothers were ready to leave, Joseph gave these instructions to his palace manager. Fill each of their sacks with as much grain as they can carry, and put each man's money back into his sack. Then put my personal silver cup on top of the youngest brother's sack, along with the money for his grain. So the manager did as Joseph instructed him. The brothers were up at dawn and were sent on their journey with their loaded donkeys. But when they had gone only a short distance and were barely out of the city, Joseph said to his palace manager, Chase after them and stop them. When you catch up with them, ask them, Why have you repaid my kindness with such evil? Why have you stolen my master's silver cup, which he uses to predict the future? What wicked thing have you done? When the palace manager caught up with the men, he spoke to them as he had been instructed. What are you talking about? The brothers responded. We are your servants and would never do such a thing. Didn't we return the money we found in our sacks? We brought it back all the way from the land of Canaan. Why would we steal silver or gold from your master's house? If you find this cup with any one of us, let that man die. And all the rest of us, my lord, will be your slaves. That's fair, the man replied. But only the one who stole the cup may be my slave. The rest of you are free to go. They all quickly took their sacks from the backs of their donkeys and opened them. The palace manager searched the brothers' sacks, from the oldest to the youngest, and the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. When the brothers saw this, they tore their clothing in despair. Then they loaded their donkeys again and returned to the city. Joseph was still in his palace when Judah and his brothers arrived, and they fell to the ground before him. What have you done? Joseph demanded. Didn't you know that a man like me can predict the future? Judah answered, Oh, my Lord, what can we say to you? How can we explain this? How can we prove our innocence? God is punishing us for our sins, my Lord. We have all returned to be your slaves, all of us, not just our brother who had the cup in his sack. No, Joseph said, I would never do such a thing. Only the man who stole the cup will be my slave. The rest of you may go back to your father in peace. Then Judah stepped forward and said, Please, my Lord, let your servant say just one word to you. Please do not be angry with me, even though you are as powerful as Pharaoh himself. My Lord, previously you asked us, your servants, do you have a father or a brother? And we responded, Yes, my Lord, we have a father who is an old man, and his youngest son is a child of his old age. His full brother is dead. And he alone is left of his father's mother's children, and his father loves him very much. And you said to us, Bring him here so I can see him with my own eyes. And we said to you, my lord, the boy cannot leave his father, for his father would die. But you told us, Unless your youngest brother comes with you, you will never see my face again. So we returned to your servant, our father, and told him what you said. Later, when he said, Go back again and buy us more food, we replied, We can't go unless we let our youngest brother go with us. We'll never get to see the man's face unless our youngest brother is with us. Then my father said to us, As you know, my wife had two sons, and one of them went away and never returned. Doubtless he was torn to pieces by some wild animal. 
and I have never seen him since. Now if you take his brother away from me, and any harm comes to him, you will send this grieving white-haired man to his grave. And now, my lord, I cannot go back to my father without the boy. Our father's life is bound up in the boy's life. If he sees the boy is not with us, our father will die. We, your servants, will indeed be responsible for sending that grieving white-haired man to his grave. My lord, I guaranteed to my father that I would take care of the boy. I told him, if I don't bring him back to you, I will bear the blame forever. So please, my lord, let me stay here as a slave instead of the boy, and let the boy return with his brothers. For how can I return to my father if the boy is not with me? I couldn't bear to see the anguish this would cause my father. Genesis 45 Joseph could stand it no longer. There were many people in the room, and he said to his attendants, Out, all of you! So he was alone with his brothers when he told them who he was. Then he broke down and wept. He wept so loudly the Egyptians could hear him, and word of it quickly carried to Pharaoh's palace. I am Joseph, he said to his brothers. Is my father still alive? But his brothers were speechless. They were stunned to realize that Joseph was standing there in front of them. Please come closer, he said to them. So they came closer, and he said again, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into slavery in Egypt. But don't be upset, and don't be angry with yourselves for selling me to this place. It was God who sent me here ahead of you to preserve your lives. This famine that has ravaged the land for two years will last five more years, and there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. God has sent me ahead of you to keep you and your families alive and to preserve many survivors. So it was God who sent me here, not you. And he is the one who made me an advisor of Pharaoh, the manager of his entire palace and the governor of all Egypt. Now hurry back to my father and tell him, This is what your son Joseph says. God has made me master over all the land of Egypt. So come down to me immediately. You can live in the region of Goshen, where you can be near me with all your children and grandchildren, your flocks and herds, and everything you own. I will take care of you there, for there are still five years of famine ahead of us. Otherwise you, your household, and all your animals will starve. Then Joseph added, Look, you can see for yourselves, and so can my brother Benjamin, that I am really Joseph. Go tell my father of my honored position here in Egypt. Describe for him everything you have seen, and then bring my father here quickly. Weeping with joy, he embraced Benjamin, and Benjamin did the same. Then Joseph kissed each of his brothers and wept over them, and after that they began talking freely with him. The news soon reached Pharaoh's palace. Joseph's brothers have arrived. Pharaoh and his officials were all delighted to hear this. Pharaoh said to Joseph, Tell your brothers this is what you must do. Load your pack animals and hurry back to the land of Canaan. Then get your father and all your families and return here to me. I will give you the very best land in Egypt and you will eat from the best the land produces. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Tell your brothers, take wagons from the land of Egypt to carry your little children and your wives and bring your father here. Don't worry about your personal belongings, for the best of all the land of Egypt is yours. So the sons of Jacob did as they were told. Joseph provided them with wagons, as Pharaoh had commanded, and he gave them supplies for the journey, and he gave each of them new clothes. But to Benjamin he gave five changes of clothes and three hundred pieces of silver. He also sent his father ten male donkeys, loaded with the finest products of Egypt, and ten female donkeys, loaded with grain and bread and other supplies he would need on his journey. So Joseph sent his brothers off, and as they left he called after them, Don't quarrel about all this along the way. And they left Egypt and returned to their father Jacob in the land of Canaan. Joseph is still alive, they told him, and he's governor of all the land of Egypt. Jacob was stunned at the news. He couldn't believe it. But when they repeated to Jacob everything Joseph had told them, and when they saw the wagons Joseph had sent to carry him, their father's spirits revived. Then Jacob exclaimed, It must be true. My son Joseph is alive. I must go and see him before I die. Genesis 46 So Jacob 
set out for Egypt with all his possessions, and when he came to Beersheba, he offered sacrifices to the God of his father, Isaac. During the night, God spoke to him in a vision. Jacob, Jacob, he called. Here I am, Jacob replied. I am God, the God of your father, the voice said. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for there I will make your family into a great nation. I will go with you down to Egypt, and I will bring you back again. You will die in Egypt, but Joseph will be with you to close your eyes. So Jacob left Beersheba, and his sons took him to Egypt. They carried him and their little ones and their wives in the wagons Pharaoh had provided for them. They also took all their livestock and all the personal belongings they had acquired in the land of Canaan. So Jacob and his entire family went to Egypt, sons and grandsons, daughters and granddaughters, all his descendants. These are the names of the descendants of Israel, the sons of Jacob, who went to Egypt. Reuben was Jacob's oldest son. The sons of Reuben were Hanak, Palua, Hezron, and Carmi. The sons of Simeon were Jemiel, Jamin, Ohad, Jakin, Zohar, and Shaul. Shaul's mother was a Canaanite woman. The sons of Levi were Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. The sons of Judah were Ur, Onan, Shelah, Perez, and Zerah. Though Ur and Onan had died in the land of Canaan, the sons of Perez were Hezron and Hamul. The sons of Issachar were Tola, Paua, Jeshub, and Shimron. The sons of Zebulun were Sered, Elon, and Jahil. These were the sons of Leah and Jacob who were born in Padan Aram. In addition to their daughter Dinah, the number of Jacob's descendants, male and female, through Leah, was thirty-three. The sons of Gad were Zephon, Haggai, Shuni, Isbon, Uri, Aradi, and Areli. The sons of Asher were Imna, Ishva, Ishvi, and Bariah. Their sister was Sarah. Bariah's sons were Heber and Milkil. These were the sons of Zilpah, the servant given to Leah by her father Laban. The number of Jacob's descendants through Zilpah was sixteen. The sons of Jacob's wife Rachel were Joseph and Benjamin. Joseph's sons, born in the land of Egypt, were Manasseh and Ephraim. Their mother was Asenath, daughter of Potipharah, the priest of On. Benjamin's sons were Bela, Beker, Eshbel, Gerah, Naman, Ahi, Rosh, Mapim, Hupim, and Ard. These are the sons of Rachel and Jacob. The number of Jacob's descendants through Rachel was fourteen. The son of Dan was Husham. The sons of Naphtali were Jahazil, Guni, Jezer, and Shilim. These were the sons of Bilhah, the servant given to Rachel by her father Laban. The number of Jacob's descendants through Bilhah was seven. The total number of Jacob's direct descendants who went with him to Egypt, not counting his sons' wives, was sixty-six. In addition, Joseph had two sons who were born in Egypt. So altogether, there were seventy members of Jacob's family in the land of Egypt. As they neared their destination, Jacob sent Judah ahead to meet Joseph and to get directions to the region of Goshen. And when they finally arrived, Joseph prepared his chariot and traveled to Goshen to meet his father Jacob. When Joseph arrived, he embraced his father and wept, holding him for a long time. Finally, Jacob said to Joseph, Now I am ready to die since I have seen your face again and know you are still alive. And Joseph said to his brothers and to his father's entire family, I will go to Pharaoh and tell him, my brothers and my father's entire family have come to me from the land of Canaan. These men are shepherds and they raise livestock. They have brought with them their flocks and herds and everything they own. Then he said, When Pharaoh calls for you and asks about your occupation, you must tell him, We, your servants, have raised livestock all our lives, as our ancestors have always done. When you tell him this, he will let you live here in the region of Goshen, for the Egyptians despise shepherds. Luke 18 One day Jesus told his disciples a story to show that they should always pray and never give up. There was a judge in a certain city, he said, who neither feared God nor cared about people. 
A widow of that city came to him repeatedly, saying, Give me justice in this dispute with my enemy. The judge ignored her for a while, but finally he said to himself, I don't fear God or care about people, but this woman is driving me crazy. I'm going to see that she gets justice, because she is wearing me out with her constant request. Then the Lord said, Learn a lesson from this unjust judge. Even he rendered a just decision in the end. So don't you think God will surely give justice to his chosen people who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will grant justice to them quickly. But when the Son of Man returns, how many will he find on the earth who have faith? Then Jesus told this story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everyone else. Two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, and the other was a despised tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself, praying this prayer. I thank you, God, that I am not like other people, cheaters, sinners, adulterers. I am certainly not like that tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give you a tenth of my income. But the tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, O oh God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. I tell you, this sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. One day some parents brought their little children to Jesus so he could touch and bless them. But when the disciples saw this, they scolded the parents for bothering him. Then Jesus called the children and said to the disciples, Let the children come to me and don't stop them, for the kingdom of God belongs to those who are like these children. I tell you the truth, anyone who doesn't receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. Once a religious leader asked Jesus this question, Good teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus asked him. Only God is truly good. But to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not commit adultery. You must not murder. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. Honor your father and mother. The man replied, I have obeyed all these commandments since I was young. When Jesus heard his answer, he said, There's still one thing you haven't done. Sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. But when the man heard this, he became very sad, for he was very rich. When Jesus saw this, he said, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. In fact, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard this said, then who in the world can be saved? He replied, What is impossible for people is possible with God. Peter said, We have left our homes to follow you. Yes, Jesus replied, And I assure you that everyone who has given up house or wife or brother or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will be repaid many times over in this life and will have eternal life in the world to come. Taking the twelve disciples aside, Jesus said, Listen, we're going up to Jerusalem, where all the predictions of the prophets concerning the Son of Man will come true. He will be handed over to the Romans, and he will be mocked, treated shamefully, and spit upon. They will flog him and whip him and kill him, but on the third day he will rise again. But they didn't understand any of this. The significance of his words were hidden from them and they failed to grasp what he was talking about. As Jesus approached Jericho, a blind beggar was sitting beside the road. When he heard the noise of a crowd going past, he asked what was happening. They told him that Jesus the Nazarene was going by. So he began shouting, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Be quiet, the people in front yelled at him. But he only shouted louder, Son of David, have mercy on me. When Jesus heard him, he stopped and ordered that the man be brought to him. As he came near, Jesus asked him, What do you want me to do for you? Lord, he said, I want to see. 
And Jesus said, all right, receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. Instantly, the man could see, and he followed Jesus, praising God, and all who saw it praised God too. And now, Lord, we ask your blessing on the reading of this word. Amen. Never give up. That's a popular sentiment these days. It's used in sports and business. It's found on t-shirts, bumper stickers. Giving up is easy. I've done it way too much in my life. I've given up on goals. I've given up on hopes. I've given up on relationships. I'm sad to say that I've given up on way too much that I needed to hold on to in this life. And I've also held on to things I should have given up long ago. I've held on to resentments and angers, my need to be right, my need for approval. I've held on to these things way too long. I should have given up on them right away. Maybe you can relate. It seems like the trick is to give up on the wrong things and never give up on the right things. In Luke 18, Jesus says that we should keep praying and never give up. Prayer seems to be connected to our ability to hold on to the right things. Prayer is a two-way conversation. It's relational. We share our hearts, our fears, our failures, our life with Him. And He shares His life, His word, His heart, His hopes for us. It's a two-way thing. God is speaking to us in prayer, and we are listening to His voice, His leading. We hear from Him and respond, and we worship Him. Without this relationship, giving up is inevitable. It's just way too easy. But when we do pray, we are given the strength to hold on, to endure, to never give up. In today's reading, we hear Jacob listening to God speak to him late at night. He hears a voice from heaven, and it happens to be in a place called Beersheba. The last time God spoke to Jacob in Beersheba, was many years before. He had been preparing to leave home and head to the land of Haran, fleeing from his brother. As he was leaving, he laid his head on a rock and he fell asleep. And while he was sleeping, he saw a stairway to heaven. And at the top of the stairway, he saw the Lord. And the Lord told him, I am the Lord, the God of your grandfather Abraham, and the God of your father Isaac. The ground you are lying on belongs to you. I'm giving it to you and your descendants. Your descendants will be as numerous as the dust of the earth. They will spread out in all directions, to the west and east, to the north and south. And all the families of the earth will be blessed through you and your descendants. What's more, I am with you, and I will protect you wherever you go. One day I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have finished giving you everything I have promised. (laughs) Well, then Jacob wakes up and he says, Surely the Lord is in this place and I wasn't even aware of it. But he also said, What an awesome place this is. It's none other than the house of God, the very gateway to heaven. That awesome place, that gateway to heaven, is where we see him sleeping right now in our passage today. It's years later, and God comes to him once again, and once again Jacob is having to leave this land that God had promised to him. God is speaking to him, and you might say that God is telling him to keep praying and never give up. Surely this journey of Jacob's didn't look anything like the fulfillment of what God had promised him all those years ago. In that very place, God had promised to make Jacob a great nation, that Canaan would be his inheritance, and that his descendants would be a blessing to all the nations of the world. It didn't look like that promise would be fulfilled any time soon. Jacob was going in the opposite direction. Jacob would die in a different land altogether without seeing this promise fulfilled. 
but out in the distance, too far for Jacob to see, God was bringing about the fulfillment of all that he had promised. Jacob needed to keep on praying and never give up. He's told that Joseph, his son, would be with him to the very end, that Joseph would close his eyes. God is saying the same thing to us. Keep praying, never give up. It may look like God has you going in the opposite direction from what he promised you. But out there in the distance, too far for you to see, he's bringing about all that he promised. Someone far better than Joseph is with us. It's not Jacob's son, but God's son, who will be with you to the very end. Hebrews 11.13 says, All these people died still believing what God had promised them. They did not receive what was promised, but they saw it all from a distance and welcomed it. They agreed that they were foreigners and nomads here on earth. So keep praying. Never give up. God is faithful. If we live a life of faith, a life of prayer, a life in relationship with Him, then we will have the strength we need to never give up. He who promised these things is faithful. He will fulfill all of His promises. We are the recipients of the promise that He made to Jacob, you and I. That promise that Jacob never got to see with his earthly eyes, God has fulfilled. Most of you aren't Jewish. You're not from the nation of Israel. You are the fulfillment of that promise. You have been included in that blessing. So let's keep praying. Let's never give up. The Son, God's Son, is with us. And He will be with us to the very end. He will close our eyes. And He will wake us up. Hallelujah. Let's continue now in a time of prayer. Feel free to read along with these prayers in the show notes of today's podcast and meditate on these words that are being spoken over you, your family, and our world. And now, let us pray. Lord God, Almighty and Everlasting Father, you have brought us in safety to this new day. Preserve us with your mighty power, that we might not fall into sin or be overcome by adversity. And in all we do, direct us to the fulfilling of your purpose. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O God, you have made of one blood all the peoples of the earth and sent your blessed Son to preach peace to those who are far and those who are near. Grant that people everywhere may seek after you and find you Bring the nations into your fold, pour out your Spirit on all flesh, and hasten the coming of your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light, and where there is sadness, joy. O Lord, grant that I might not seek so much to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in the giving that we receive, in the pardoning that we are pardoned. It is in the dying that we are born unto eternal life. Amen. And now as our Lord has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, friends, we have spent another perfectly good 30 minutes praying and having prayers prayed over us. We have had our hearts pointed in the direction of Jesus. We've been doing a little soul work, my friend. We've invested into our souls, and as far as Jesus is concerned, that, my friend, is a good investment. He says, is there anything more valuable than your soul? And the answer to his rhetorical question is no. (laughs) No. No, he has given us this treasure, my friend. So let us invest that treasure well. Before I let you go, I want to encourage you, if you haven't done this already, to sign up for our daily podcast email reminder. It is an email that comes to your inbox every day free of charge. It includes a link to the day's podcast, a summary and show notes, and the prayers of the day's podcast. And it is a great tool, a reminder to keep taking steps in the direction of Jesus here in 2024. You can sign up at the webpage or right in the show notes. And last of all, let me encourage you to like, share, and subscribe to this podcast wherever it is that you get yours. Be it YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever it is, your subscriptions, your following makes a difference. But what do you say we take a step in the direction of Jesus again tomorrow? That's my plan. Lord willing and the creek don't rise. Your brother Hunter plans on being here. Until that time, let's go forward in God's joy. Let's let his joy be our strength. And let us always remember this. That you are loved. No doubt about it. Alrighty, I'll talk to you again tomorrow. You guys take care.